Welcome to our colloquium today. Uh, our speaker is Chris Lindpott at the University of Oxford. I first met Chris two years ago in Cape Town at a conference called Dot Astronomy, which is the intersection between astronomy and the internet and the wider world. Uh, so it's thinking about some of the larger scale issues of how astronomy interfaces with everything else around us. Chris is a professor at Oxford, the host of BBC's um, Sky at Night. He's also a AAS editor and on the Breakthrough Listen Advisory Council, among many other accolades. Uh, it's been great having him in town so far. I got him lost in the thicket patch yesterday, uh, so we have some cuts to prove that. And today he's going to be chatting with us about Galaxy Zoo to LSST, citizen science in the age of big data. Uh, if you do have questions throughout, I've been encouraged to encourage you to interrupt Chris, and then we'll have a larger discussion at the end. So cool. thanks for coming all this way. Thanks, Will. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I've had a great time uh, exploring all parts of the site, as you just heard from, from Will. It's, it's great to be here, uh, and not just because this is the only astronomy audience I can guarantee not to be distracted by their phones, uh, which is, is rather wonderful. Um, I want to start by telling you about a planetary system. Uh, it's the K2138 system, um, discovered in the second phase of the Kepler mission. Um, this, uh, when originally announced by Jesse Christensen and the team, including me and uh, two of my colleagues, um, was a five-planet system. Uh, there's a schematic diagram here, B, C, D, E, and F, K2138, conveniently discovered in the right order. Um, all of these planets are, are crammed close to a dwarf star. Um, B might be a rocky planet, but probably not the others. They're all uh, bigger, much bigger than the Earth, and they're on tight orbit, so B goes around every couple of days. But the distinctive feature of this system is that this is a long resonant chain of planets. So for every two times B goes round, C goes round three times, for every two times, sorry, every three times B goes round, C goes round twice, for every three times C goes round, D goes round twice, and so on all the way out. And this has wonderful properties. One of the things it means is that you can make nice uh, little animations. So this is by Matt Russo. So what we've done here is animated the system, uh, and every time the planets complete an orbit, they chime and the uh, pitch of the note depends on the size of the orbit. And so you get this sort of slightly calming post-lunch music. Uh, but the reason that that sounds musical is because you're in this resonant pattern, right? For those who are musical, there's a roughly perf a perfect fifth between each of these notes. Um, so that's quite exciting, but of course the fact these are in a resonant chain also tells you something about planet formation. These are planets that will have formed further from their star than they are now. They will have migrated in, and because they're in this resonant pattern, it tells you that they formed in a simultaneous process, that it wasn't a chaotic process, but rather these planets, as they were forming, interacted gravitationally um, to fall into this nice, neat, resonant pattern. And actually, the story is even more interesting than that. Um, when these planets were discovered, there were hints in the light curve of a uh, sixth planet, uh, conveniently called G. Uh, we managed to go and confirm this. This is Kevin Hardigree Ullman's work. Uh, with This is a light curve from Spitzer with a transit. And so the sixth planet uh, is here. And it nearly, but not quite, fits the pattern. So if you imagine a missing planet in here, so for every three times F goes around, the missing planet will go around twice. For every three times that goes around, the next planet will go around twice. For every three times that will go around, where you all nearly, but not quite, hit the period of G. Here's the actual pattern uh, with the resonance shown in blue and the real data shown in red. And I find this fascinating because this is a planet that was obviously connected in this resonant chain, but which is slightly off. And so, again, there are detailed lessons for planet formation to be found here. But that's not the reason I'm telling you about this, this, this set of planets. I'm mostly a galaxies person, as you'll hear. I'm telling you about these planets because they were found not by astronomers who built and operated the telescope, not by the people running the K2 mission office. But these planets were found by citizen scientists, by volunteers, using a website called Exoplanet Explorers, which uh, Jessie uh, and her team put together. So Exoplanet Explorers invited people to discover new planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy. Um, it had this as a user interface. So this is not a set of pretty pictures. 
This is science as it's really done, as all of you in the room will know. This is staring at graphs to try and gain understanding. And so what volunteers were presented with is an entire like, so um, the data from K2 was processed by a machine learning routine. Um, potential planets were picked out, and then the graphs show the individual transits, the light curve folded on the likely period, so you've got the nice transit here, and then some zoom-ins and some checks for other data. And then despite the complexity of this, the only question that was asked was, does this look like a transiting planet? And many, many people, hundreds of thousands of people, went through most of the K2 data set to look for this, yeah. So just to understand, the machine learning algorithm search for candidates and then produce these plots for each kind of candidate. That's right. But so most person to say, yes, this actually is a good That's right. So most of, so the machine learning, as I, I'll go on to discuss this in more detail, but um, if you want to get as many planets as possible out of the data, that you can't have the machine learning algorithm tuned so much that it only produce, that the, the accuracy is very high. So you accept a lower accuracy, you end up with lots of candidates, and then you need to inspect the results. Uh, this one was first spotted by this guy. This is Andrew Gray, who's a uh, mechanic in Darwin in Australia. Uh, this is him on uh, local television the day after he discovered his planets. He was allowed on TV by his boss as long as he was in the workshop and was wearing the branded polo shirt. Uh, I love this story. Andrew was really excited by, by the discovery, uh, but he's also Australian. And so he was asked how he was going to celebrate finding these planets. And he said uh, that he was going to drag his telescopes out into the desert and have a beer with them, yeah. which I think is a, a beautifully stereotypical response to discovery. Um, but this is actually a trick we've played many times before. We had volunteers look through um, the entire Kepler and K2 data sets, um, not just with Exoplanet Explorers, but originally with a project called Planet Hunters, uh, which didn't have the machine learning precursor, just had people looking at raw light curves. Um, Planet Hunters, this is a graph the end of the Kepler main mission. So this is the size of the planet in the period. Each dot is a Kepler planet. And the yellow and red dots there are discoveries from the planet hunt, validated planet candidate discoveries. So these are things with a 95% chance of being actual planets from the Planet Hunters data set. And Planet Hunters, the volunteers, were responsible for 10% of the candidates with a period greater than 100 days to come out of the Kepler mission. And half of the planet candidates with uh, periods greater than 600 days. And that's not hugely surprising. What the volunteers are good at finding are the single transit events, or the events where there's less statistical significance. If you have 20 or 30 transits because you're a short period planet, then the machine learning does a good job. But when you have rarer events, turns out inspecting the light curve still does you uh, a lot of good. And so it's not surprising that we tend to these longer periods, but it is encouraging. And we continued with this uh, into the era of TESS, which is NASA's new planet finding satellite. It's been in orbit for over a year now, uh, looking for planets around brighter stars rather than the faint distant stars that Kepler looked at. And my student Nora Eisner is running um, <coughs> Planet Hunters TESS, and we're finding, again, long period planets or longer period planets that are being missed by the automated routines. So Nora, last week, announced the likely discovery of our first planet candidates. So this is a good example of what I mean by citizen science project. We've got data that was collected by professionals, in this case from satellites, um, collected for their own purposes, not collected because somebody thought the volunteers were going to look through the data. And then there's an interface which has allowed volunteers to meaningfully interact with the data and produce results that are then published in the normal scientific literature with the help of some volunteers, uh, so some, some research scientists. Now we hit on this model not because we were looking for planets, but because I cared about things like these. Um, I arrived in Oxford as a postdoc in 2006, working for, for Joe Silk, um, who was terrifying. Um, and I was a bit distracted, but one of the things I was trying to do was understand the astrochemistry of star formation in galaxies of different morphology, um, or rather galaxies where the environment within the galaxy might differ and that might affect the chemistry uh, of the star forming regions. Um, I quickly realized that to do that, I needed to classify the galaxies that I was working with. Um, 
state of the art at the time was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, the main galaxy sample from Sloan has about 950,000 images of galaxies. These are carefully selected nice examples. Most of them look like faint fuzzy blobs, uh, but you can still discern spiral arms and, and other features. I'd intended to just sort the galaxies out by colour. Um, most spiral galaxies are blue, most elliptical galaxies are red, that's good enough. But of course, if you're looking at the star formation properties, by selecting on colour, you've made a decision about the star for current star formation in each galaxy. So if you want to understand the history of the galaxy, you need to disentangle colour from morphology. Uh, think of the morphology as the integrated dynamical history of the stars in the galaxy. In Oxford, there was a PhD student called Kevin Schwinski who had just finished looking at 50,000 galaxies by eye. Um, and so I had my solution. I took Kevin for a beer and I suggested to him that it would be great if he looked at the other 900,000 galaxies in Sloan. Kevin was not keen. Um, he told me roughly where I could stick the 900,000 galaxies. Um, nor was it plausible to get 20 more students to look at galaxies. And, and of course, there's an inherent flaw in doing that anyway. If we'd found anything unusual, one could always uh, argue with the results by attacking Kevin. Uh, you could always just say, look, these classifications are wrong, go do them again. Machine learning at the time was not up to the task. Um, as ever, with machine learning, it proved easy to get to sort of 70 or 80% accuracy. Difficult, the work of a PhD, to get to 90% accuracy. Uh, and getting beyond that was very tough. And so we went for the simplest solution we could think of that worked, which was just to recruit more Kevins. And so we created a website called Galaxy Zoo. This is what web design looked like in 2007. Uh, it's got frames and everything. Um, and we tried to collect the simplest possible information. So this site produced a random image of a galaxy from Sloan. Uh, it asked you whether it was an elliptical or a spiral. If it was a spiral, we asked which way the arms were turning. If you want to know why we asked that, ask me afterwards. Uh, I don't have time to get into it now. <laughs> and that was it. And the idea was that I would go and talk to local astronomical societies, groups of amateur astronomers, um, maybe talk to 50 people. Maybe 50 people would go home and classify 20 galaxies each. We worked out that if I gave a, a talk a month in five to seven years, we could work our way through the entire Sloan sample. And this would be a nice public engagement, maybe with a bit of research project. Turns out the internet doesn't work like that. The web doesn't work like that. You can't succeed slowly on the web. What happened was that the day after launching the project, we were receiving 70,000 classifications an hour uh, from people all over the world. The servers, which were hosted at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, um, melted, and they got us back online for reasons I don't really understand. Um, and, and this idea that people could contribute in just a few moments to uh, science really, really took off. Um, better than that, it became apparent really quickly that the results taken collectively were accurate. Not just more accurate than the machine learning we had available, but actually the volunteers were better than Kevin. Because a single classifier working his way through 50,000 galaxies in a couple of weeks gets things wrong. Whereas if you have, we had so many people, we could have lots of people look at each galaxy. And so there, there aren't any mistaken classifications. There are wrong classifications, but no one hits the, hits the wrong button. We also, because we had lots of people look at each galaxy, had some sense of how accurate each classification was. With Kevin, we had a binary choice. He said it was a spiral, or he said it was an elliptical. With Galaxy Zoo, I could distinguish galaxies where 20 out of 20 people say it's a spiral from those where 12 out of 20 say it's a spiral. And while that's not a probability, you have some sense of confidence. You get a classification and a confidence. Now, we've gone on to use Galaxy Zoo results um, in many different ways. We've finished Sloan. We're now doing decals in the southern sky. We've done UKIDs in the infrared. We've done most of the big Hubble surveys. We've even classified some simulated galaxies uh, to show that the simulators who run these big cosmological simulations haven't quite got everything right just yet. Um, but I just want to give you three stories of the use to which we put Galaxy Zoo data to give you an idea of the kind of research you can do with this. And there are three different kinds of stories. So the first thing you can do, if you have a large catalogue of galaxies labelled by morphology, 
is look at the population of galaxies as a whole. And you know where this is going, because if you organize the whole population of galaxies by morphology, you get this, right? This is the traditional tuning fork. Um, this is uh, a version that Karen Masters from Haverford put together using slow images, but you've got this traditional sense of ellipticals on one side, spirals on the other, split into barred and unbarred. Uh, and as everyone knows, you go from SA through SB to SC uh, via two criteria. The arms get less wound as you move from one end to the other, and the bulges become more dominant. If you go all the way back to Hubble in 1936, but via Devocalors and the Atlas of Galaxies and all the classic papers on morphology, they tell you that these two things move in step. Turns out that's not true. So, or at least classifications these days of SASB and SC spirals depend only on um, one of those factors. So this is Galaxy Zoo data. It's a slightly complicated plot, but this is um, the size of the bulge, uh, roughly the uh, ratio of the bulge to the disk. So these are bulge-dominated galaxies. Sorry, these are bulge-dominated disk galaxies. So all of these are spiral. Uh, and these are uh, ones with almost no bulge. And this is how wound the arms are. And you can see that galaxies with small bulges down here on the left have got a wide range of arm winding values. They can be tightly wound or they can be loosely wound. Whereas galaxies at the high end, the large bulges, there you favour tighter arms. So that's interesting because it's not what the textbooks tell you we're doing when we classify on the Hubble sequence, which is quite fun. Um, but it's also telling you about sort of the winding speed of the galaxies. If you think of the fact that these spiral arms may be winding up, that may be a function of bulge size. So that the large bulge affects the dynamics in the disk and the spiral arms wind, wind up over time. There's much more to be said about that, but that's example one. We can use the whole population of galaxies. Example two is what happens when you just take a subset. We went back and instead of just asking for spiral versus elliptical galaxies, we went and asked how many spiral arms people could see, what the size of the bulge was, whether there's a bar. There. And that allows you to look at, for example, the influence of the bar on the galaxy. This is a plot from Brooke Simmons, uh, who's now at Lancaster. Uh, this is the bar fraction uh, over time from a variety of galaxy zoo results. Um, the new points here are the, the black dots, which were from the Candle survey classified by galaxy zoo volunteers. And you can see the proportion of disk galaxies that have a bar drops dramatically as you go back to Redshift 1 or so. So something happens at about Redshift 1 which allows stable disks that can support the presence of bars. It's quite fun. This, I love this, this point uh, is not quite zero. We have found barred galaxies out there which are interesting in themselves. And one can go further. I had a student, Chandor Crook, who's now at ESA as a science fellow, who assembled a very large sample of bars from the galaxies whose data who went and fitted the individual components, and you can start to do things like look at the colours of the bars and the disks. So this is, um, let's see, on the left here, these are low mass galaxies, and you have uh, the colours in G minus I of disk, bar, and bulge. And you can see that for these low mass galaxies, the bar is intermediate in colour between the blue disk, where the star formation action happens, and the red bulge, which is primarily older stars. Uh, but at high mass galaxies, the split is 10 to the 20, 10.25 uh, in log space here, uh, the three are much closer together. So there's something happening with the bars at low masses that isn't happening at high masses. There's lots more to say about that, but that's example two. Take a subset and uh, see what you can see. And then the third example is probably my favourite. There's something odd about this world of big data and big surveys that we're in at the minute, which I suspect lots of you in the room have encountered. Um, Sloan has its power, and Galaxy Zoo's labels of Sloan are, are powerful because they allow us to assemble these really large samples of galaxies. That, those plots from Chandra involve tens of thousands of BART galaxies. Uh, Karen's study involved hundreds of thousands of disk galaxies to look at that distribution along the Hubble sequence. But often what we do is take these really large samples and then throw almost all of them away. 
because we want to look at the rare and interesting objects that come up only a few times in large samples. And so our example of that for today are uh, galaxies like this one. This is NGC 4395, which is a flocculent spiral. I try and get it into all my talks because I like saying the word flocculent uh, a lot. And this was studied by Filipenko and Ho. And the idea here is that this is a disk galaxy which has no bulge at its center. And if you look at the simulations by Phil Hopkins or whoever you, you want to talk to, you'll discover that it's remarkably easy to create a bulge if you have any sort of merger with a galaxy. So if I take a disk and I throw in a smaller galaxy, maybe even one that's a tenth of the mass of the primary, you'll kick up enough stars to create a detectable bulge. So where you have a bulgeless galaxy like this one, you know that it's guaranteed to be merger-free. So the history of this galaxy, at least back to a redshift of two or three, is one of isolated evolution. And so we can use this as a laboratory to understand what mergers contribute to the formation of the normal galaxy population. And so what Filipinko and Ho did here was look at the black hole mass at the center of this galaxy. And they found that the mass of the black hole in the center of this galaxy was no bigger than 300,000 solar masses. It's about a tenth of the size, sorry, a tenth of the mass that you'd expect in a galaxy of this type. And so they suggested this is a galaxy that's evolved in a purely secular fashion, a non-merger fashion. It's got a small black hole, therefore mergers are important for the growth of black holes in galaxies. And if you know the history of this subject, you'll know that mergers are a convenient explanation for what well, it also gets called the Ligurian plot, but the idea that the black hole mass correlates with the galaxy mass. If both assemble through mergers, then you can naturally explain that result. So we thought we'd test this. This is work led by Brooke Simmons, who I've mentioned, and Becky Smithhurst, who's now a research fellow uh, back in Oxford with us after time in Nottingham. And these are 113 galaxies from Sloan, which have two distinguishing features. Firstly, from Galaxy Zoo, and then expert inspection to make sure we were right, these are bulgeless systems. So these have not had mergers in the last eight to nine billion years or so. And you'll also, as you can see by eye, um, these are AGN. So these are the 113 AGN in Sloan in bulgeous galaxies that are near enough that we can be sure that they're bulgeous. So we've taken our million galaxy sample from Sloan, and now we're writing a paper about 113 galaxies. That's that big data to small data shuffle that lots of us have got used to doing. Then we went and used, these all have broad emission lines. We went and estimated the black hole masses, uh, and we got these amazing results. So, this is the diagram I mentioned. This is the bulge mass of a normal galaxy in the black hole mass. And this is the standard relation that we're used to seeing from Herring and Riggs. These are normal galaxies. So there's this relation between the mass of the black hole and the mass of the bulge. Remember, these are normal galaxies. Both bulge and black hole assemble by mergers. You get this, for astronomers, what is quite a nice tight correlation. So let's add our galaxies. Here they are. There's sort of quite a lot scattered. There were two where we were able to measure the black hole mass. The rest of these are estimates. Um, I should say, by the way, these are bulgeless galaxies, and I plotted the bulge mass. This is a conservative estimate. So what we did for each one of these was to work out how much light you could hand, hide in a galaxy bulge underneath the AGM that's there. So this is, you should think of this as a minimum. So these are all upper limits. And when you plot the line through this, you get this. So there's the limits on bulge mass. Um, this is the best fit for this data because you've got these two uh, detections and then this population of limits. And this is very different from this, um, which makes sense. I think I've got, yeah, this is the line that the referee made us plot, uh, which is wrong statistically. Uh, but this treats all of these as detections, but it's still different from this. So I've just shown you the most boring result you'll ever see in a seminar, right? These are galaxies selected to have no or little bulge. And I've shown you that for given black hole mass, they have a smaller than expected bulge mass. Right? This is incredibly boring. What's really exciting is this, because if you plot the total mass instead of the bulge mass, you find that there's no difference between these galaxies and the normal galaxies. So these galaxies have the black hole mass that you'd expect for a galaxy of their mass. 
So that tells you, first of all, that the black hole mass is sensitive to the whole galaxy mass, not just to the bulge. And secondly, that mergers don't have much to do with the growth of black holes. Sure, they help, but the bulk of material, bulk of the growth, comes through secular processes. It's a really nice, I think, unusual example of how we can use a small set of galaxies that have an unusual history to constrain a mechanism uh, for a broad question in galaxy formation. Turns out, of course, the theorists knew this all along. It always turns out the theorists knew this all along. Uh, this is Gareth Martin, who's a group, uh, in a group at the University of Hertfordshire. He's just moved to Tucson. And he runs, uh, the, helps run the Horizon AGN simulation, one of these big cosmological simulations. And this is a cumulative plot of the black hole growth in the simulation over cosmic time. And so the black is the total growth, um, but these dotted lines represent the contribution from major and minor mergers. So this is the total merger contribution to the black hole growth. And this gap is the secular evolution that we've just picked up observationally. So we can go back and forth with observation. So three modes of using these sorts of data. We can do large population studies, we can look at subsets, and we can get drilled down and get stories from one to 100. Yeah? Can you just go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So I'm not sure I completely understood the reasoning behind why, from this sample, the black hole mass is not connected to mergers. Uh, so the that the bulges track the merger history better than the total galaxy mass? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And in this case, in the black dots, these remember these are all limits. Right. So these are these are our typical bulge masses. So these are these are galaxies with almost no bulge. And yet, when you plot them on a bulge map, black hole mass versus total mass, they scatter, but the relation is pretty close to the normal. Now, you might say it's not exactly the same. There's a gap between this red line and this black line. So the black holes are systematically slightly smaller. Well, that's OK. We know in the theory there is this cumulative contribution from mergers, but most of the black hole growth is secular. Does that help, at least? Two, what's CDF? Sorry, that's the cumulative, it's just a cumulative function. So if one is the normalized black hole mass okay. uh, today, then um, you can see where that's come from. So I'm going really quickly because I'm trying to cover But, but the theory is that the black hole mass grows by accretion from its surroundings and not by any merger of other black holes. No, no, that's right. But um, if you look back a few years, people are saying, okay, so what controls the rate of accretion? Obviously, if you're thinking radio AGM, then, then it's the AGM itself that can control the rate of accretion. But in, in terms of a galaxy, the idea was that if you merge, you promote accretion onto the center through sure. chaotic processes and, and, and so on. So what I'm saying is that the AGM must grow, so the black hole must grow through accretion, uh, but through steady accumulation of material over a long period rather than just stochastically merger after merger after merger. Happy to talk much more about this, but I should move on. So, Galaxy Zoo also inspired a whole host of other projects. Uh, one which I wish I had time to talk about, but it's not my science, is Radio Galaxy Zoo, which ran for a long while, for about five years, uh, which did cross-matching of WISE with FIRST and ECLAS radio data to try and, and improve the number of source identifications that were available. So these were people visually inspecting uh, the overlay of radio survey and infrared data and identifying which, if any, sources matched the infrared sources. Um, I'd encourage you to look at Julie Banfield's work. There's a catalog paper, there's a catalog released that you can go and get. Uh, we've had some fun on the way. We found some hybrid radio galaxies, which are FR1 on one side and FR2 on the other, which I suspect people here know more about than I do. And then there's a great paper by Avery Garon from Minnesota, which just came out a few months ago, uh, where he's looking at using a very large sample of galaxies. He's looking at how the bending of jets from these radio galaxies is affected by their environment and clusters, and finding what you'd expect, I think, that the jets are more bent the closer to the center of the cluster you are, but more than half of those galaxies that have bent jets are outside clusters, but still in denser regions of the, the, the universe. So uh, I'll pass this slide around later, perhaps, and you should have a look. 
Zotras Galaxies, um, I did promise that there'd be pictures of penguins, so we started to get phone calls from other scientists who were interested in the fact that our volunteers, who by the way, by this point were about 1.6 million strong, started to look at galaxies. People wanted us to help them with their data problems. A guy called Tom Hart, who's a penguinologist, self-described in, in the Department of Zoology in Oxford Corps. And Tom used to go to the Antarctic every year to count penguins, literally. His data set was to go to a, a single, a different sites around the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, and each year he'd count the penguins. And he was trying to look at how the colonies were sensitive to um, climate change, to fishery, to scientific activity, to tourism. Um, and then he discovered you could buy cheap hunting cameras, mount them with car batteries, and they'd last the Antarctic winter. So these things take a picture every hour for about nine months of the year. And Tom now goes around, spends a summer, Antarctic summer, running around replacing the uh, memory cards and the batteries and coming back to Oxford with eight million images a year. And he still needs to count the penguins. So here's a typical image. Uh, this is a task eminently suitable for uh, human classification. Bit post lunch, I can see there's some slumping in the chairs. Let's do some audience participation. How many penguins are in the image? Three. Three. Anyone want to say anything else? There's usually a computer scientist somewhere who says 2.4 or something like that. But, but three is a good answer, so that's nice. Uh, we'll try another one. Just, just shout when you, you know the answer. <laughs> all, of, all of them is a good answer. Uh, usually people say lots or too many is nice. Um, What's cool about this is it shows, I think, you had a very human reaction to that. If I train a CNN modern machine learning routine on this, and then I give it this, uh, it either gets it wrong or occasionally it says there's one big penguin, which is slightly, <laughs> which is slightly terrifying. Humans are able to deal with the unexpected and just say there's something unusual. But we realized we could use the same software that we built for Galaxy Zoo to support penguin counting. So this is Penguin Watch which I highly recommend to you. Um, something like 8 million images a year processed by the system. And the original name of this project was Penguin Hunters, which I think you could sort of see in the design. Uh, but the biologists were less keen on that branding. So Penguin Watch is safer, uh, I think. And, and the results from Penguin Watch have, have shown that the, the thing that's affecting the penguins more than anything else is the fishing for krill that happens in the Southern Ocean. And um, we've managed to get some of the protected areas changed as a result of the work done by the Penguin Watch volunteers. So because we have this demand for projects, we now run about 100 or so different projects, about 20 of them astronomical. Um, we built a tool called the Project Builder, which anyone can go and play with, so zooniverse.org slash lab, which will let you build your own Zooniverse project in about 20 minutes. So if you've got data, and you've forced your summer students to classify it by eye, or if you're forcing your PhD students to sit and click and, and label things, um, you should consider this sort of approach. Uh, it's effective, and it um, also produces excellent public engagement. Now, I want to, I've got about 15 minutes left, so I want to talk a bit about some of the extra things that happen when you let large crowds of volunteers uh, look through your data. Uh, and, and really, I think about this using a project called Snapshot Serengeti. So Snapshot Serengeti has 200 motion-sensitive cameras in the Serengeti National Park. And it takes, these are all real images from these cameras, which are motion-sensitive. Um, and the task here is to label which of about 60 kinds of animal are in frame. So obviously, that's a giraffe, that's a lion, that's a porcupine, some sort of stripy horse, I think. Um, but occasionally you get things that are less easy. Uh, anyone know what this is? Skunk. skunk. Yes, well, I guess you'd think, yeah, this is called a zorilla. It's their equivalent of a skunk. It's less stinky, uh, but much the same. Uh, and zorillas appear in one in four million images. So for every four million images you get from the camera network, one of them will show a zorilla. This is the best photo we've, we've found of one so far. Um, and immediately you can see that this is interesting. If you didn't know Zorillas existed, there would be no way that you could program a machine learning routine to efficiently find these things. You could probably find, we have actually built the world's most accurate giraffe finding piece of software. Um, so you can now check, it's open source, you can check if there are giraffes in your data, 
for free, uh, and it's pretty accurate, but it's much harder to find, find a Zorilla. And in astronomy, we have lots of space Zorillas. Right? I think we're, we're actually quite unique in areas that are dealing with large data, in that we care when something's very unusual. Right? Google deals with large data when they're looking at search behavior and so on, but if one search result is weird, then they don't care. Facebook doesn't care if it gets one in 200 of my friends wrong labeling them uh, very often. We care because those are the unusual objects. What we found through these citizen science projects was that people make discoveries. They find the unexpected. They have that human reaction, not just saying there are too many penguins, but they can say, what's that? We first realized that with this object. This is Honey's Vauvet, uh, which was discovered by a Dutch school teacher called Honey Van Arkel. Um, Vorwerp, I'm guessing this is a radio astronomy community, so there must be people in the room who speak Dutch. Uh, sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, we thought Vorwerp was a technical term when Honey used it, so that's what we used. It turns out it means thingy in yeah. Dutch. Okay. Yes. Um, but this is, this is an interesting object. It turns out, um, it's at the same redshift as this galaxy, which is a lurk, uh, an infrared bright galaxy. Um, there's no sign of any stellar continuum in here, but the emission lines tell you that the, there's gas here at about 50,000 Kelvin. Uh, this is an O3 image, but you also see some highly excited lines. Um, and so we thought, okay, that's easy. There's a AGN in this galaxy. If you have a jet, as many of you will know, if you have jets in spiral galaxies, they tend to be at right angles to the disk. So this is right in line for being hit with a jet. And this is a sort of uh, relic of the AGN activity in the galaxy, which is fine. Except that when you look with X-ray telescopes, if you looked with XMM and Suzaku, we found uh, no, almost no AGN activity at the center of this galaxy. Certainly nothing luminous enough to cause this degree of ionization. And so the hypothesis we came up with was that this is essentially a light echo. So this distance is about 50,000 light years. So the, the Vorwerk is telling us what we would have seen at the center of the galaxy 50,000 years ago. So the, the, we, we observed the center of this galaxy directly versus seeing some interaction with the Vorberg and then out to us as well. So it's a 50,000 year delay. And so you can then come up with the idea that this would have been a very bright AGN 50,000 years ago. It would have in fact been the nearest quasar to us. Uh, the center of the galaxy would have been magnitude 8.5 or something like that. Uh, which is an impressive but meaningless stat. Um, and so this is a galaxy that shut down very quickly. And you can use the ionization of the Volvo to trace how that's happened. So that's one part of the story, that's the scientific story. What was fun though was that Hanny became famous. Uh, she was on Dutch national television. We flew her to a AAS meeting, uh, which she considered the height of glamour. Um, it was in Seattle, which helped. Um, and the other galaxies who volunteers wanted a bit of this lifestyle as well. So other people started looking for their own Volverpen. Uh, and while we didn't find anything quite as spectacular, these are Hubble Space Telescope images of ionized gas clouds around AGN identified by Galaxy Zoo volunteers. And again, the green here is O3. Uh, so these are called the Volverpies, which is the diminutive of Volver. It's amazing what you learn in this job. Uh, and what we've done, in, in, we had a sample of about 25 of these, and two thirds of them showed signs of dramatic fading. If you looked at the luminosity of the AGN now versus the luminosity indicated by the ionization in the gas clouds. And so what we were able to do in work led by Bill Keel at Alabama is read off the history of these galaxies. So for each line here is a different galaxy. This is the required uh, ionization parameter, uh, so the required degree of ionization uh, as a function of projected radius. Now obviously there's a large error bar in here because you don't know the angle, you don't know whether something's here or here or here. Um, but nonetheless, if you wipe that out, you can see there's a pattern in these galaxies of very rapid fading of ionization from these galaxies. And so we think these are, are galaxies that have undergone a recent rapid shutdown in their AGM. Um, we could talk about what that means, and I'd be interested to hear, hear from many of you about, about your thoughts about that. 
But what I think is fascinating is that we can access what the AGN is doing on timescales of tens of thousands of years, which is otherwise really tricky to do. And this all came, this has become 10 years worth of work for various people, but it came from honey going, there's something weird in this object, that sort of human interaction. And this keeps happening. If I go back to planet hunters, this is a, a, a figure from a paper uh, studying one particular star in, in the Kepler field, which has these sort of shark uh, thin transits. Uh, these were found by a guy called Tom Jacobs, who's an author on the paper. Tom was a Planet Hunters volunteer. He was, he's not a scientist, uh, but he became very interested in the Kepler mission. Uh, and he went back and read a, a lot of the old papers that were available online. And he found an old prediction of what a transiting exocomet would look like. Uh, and it turns out if you model that, then if you have a comet very close to its star, you get these sharp tooth transits. And then from the paper, they say, in an effort to further explore the larger Kepler data set for isolated transits or aperiodic phenomena, one of us, the citizen scientists, not the scientists on the paper, undertook a detailed visual search of the complete Kepler light curve archive. So he looked at light curves by himself for 200,000 target stars in enough detail that he spotted these things which were on timescales of a few hours. And it turns out there's only one star in the 150,000 that Kepler looked at in its primary mission that shows these exocomet transits. And then Tom sent an email to the scientist who's written the paper 20 years ago and said, I found your exocomets. And they collaborated together to write a paper. Uh, these days, Tom writes his own papers. So this is a, a recently published uh, note on single transits and eclipses observed by K2 by two citizen scientists. Um, these, this was published in research notes of the American National Honor Society, which I uh, edit, and which is a non-refereed uh, publication for two-page papers designed for quick results, um, non-notable results, observational reports, and all sorts of things. And I'd happily talk to anyone about research notes. So, we've now got a system that can involve large amounts of people in research. We've got a system that produces real, usable scientific results, but which also inspires people to go and find the unusual, do their own research, and then tell us about it. So what's happening next? Well, I spend a lot of my time thinking about this thing. This is uh, now about a year old, but this is the construction site for LSST, uh, eight meter class optical telescope with a specially designed optical, optical system to do a wide field survey uh, that nominally is going to do the whole sky every three nights. Um, LSST uh, data rates are ridiculous. We're expecting about 30, well actually they're not to radio astronomers, but for optical people they're ridiculous. We're expecting 30 terabytes a night. Uh, but the thing that's really scary is that the system will broadcast alerts of things that have changed from night to night. So the alert stream is expected to be about 10 million alerts a night. Uh, that number could easily be three or four times higher. No one's done this with an eight meter, so we're not sure. Now, lots of people have thought about how to filter that alert stream, uh, mostly motivated by finding more of existing known objects. So particularly cosmologists, for example, are interested in type 1a supernovae. We've been thinking about this too, and as, far ago, uh, as long ago as 2010, we ran a Galaxy Zoo supernova project where we showed people a reference image, a new image, this is from the Palomar Transient Factory, uh, subtract one from the other, you get a nice clean supernova, and then we ask people a set of questions, essentially having them do the final stage of filtering. That worked quite well. We released data once a week. We had a dedicated, dedicated crowd of astronomers and citizen scientists who would turn up on a Tuesday lunchtime and in half an hour would classify a week's worth of data. We could pass that back to the scientists. But we realized what we were really doing was producing a large training set for machine learning. And uh, this group led by Josh Bloom and co uh, automated their search for transients. They used uh, our data and other data to train a modern neural network to do a good job of identifying supernovae. And we shut the project down. In some sense, we declared victory, right? We no longer needed volunteers to find these supernovae. Give me some satisfaction a little while later when uh, this happened. Uh, this is supernova 2014J, which is a nearby type 1A supernova in M82, everyone's favorite uh, 
disturbed local galaxy. Uh, and this was missed by all the professional surveys, and in fact, actually, by three or four amateur surveys, because it was rejected by, because it was too bright. So the machine learning routines had learned that anything this bright couldn't possibly be real. Uh, it was spotted by a bunch of undergraduates at the University of London Observatory who were taking images for fun, uh, and their, their supervisor, Steve Fossey, who knew M82 well enough to spot immediately that there was an extra star in it. Um, but this is one example. We decided to be a bit more systematic, so we relaunched the system. Uh, this is Supernova Hunters. This is using data from um, PanStars. And Daryl Wright, who was at Belfast and Oxford, now in Minnesota, uh, did two things with the PanStars supernova data. Firstly, he trained a convolutional neural network uh, to recognize real supernovae. And then he passed a lot of the data through the system to Zooniverse volunteers. And these are the results. So each dot here is a candidate supernova. They've been classified by experts into um, yellow and red are potential supernovae. Blue are asteroids, which look like supernovae and then move, uh, in my limited understanding. So, uh, and then green is, is noise. So what you want to do here is try and separate green from everything else. And on the x-axis is the score that Daryl's convolutional neural network gave to the each uh, item. And, and if it scored less than 0.4, we didn't even bother showing it to people. We got rid of the really obviously boring stuff. And then this is the human score provided by Zooniverse volunteers on the y-axis. And I hope you can see, just by eye, that the best way to divide green from the other colors here isn't a vertical or a horizontal line, but it's a diagonal. In other words, the combination of human and machine classification outperforms either on its own. And we found this again and again with real astronomical data that the combination of human plus machine outperforms either on its own. What tends to happen is that machines are very good at things that sit within the bulk of the expected population, and then humans are very good at dealing with the unexpected. I was giving this talk somewhere else, or a version of this talk somewhere else, a week ago, and somebody told me about an old experiment getting uh, machine learning routines to classify undergraduate essays, where they found that you could distinguish a quite good essay from a quite bad essay by machine, but only humans could tell the brilliant from the awful. Uh, and I think that's now my, my metaphor for this. This is what's going on here. And so what we have for the future, for LSST style things, is sort of humans and machines working together, as exemplified by this lovely image, which I found on the internet. And actually, we can do better than that. My student, Mike Wormsley, has built what's called a probabilistic CNA. So normally, when you're training a machine learning model, what you're trying to do is predict some property of the data, and then you measure the error. So in this case, you'd be trying to predict the probability, you predict whether this is a supernova or not, and then you count how many you get right and how many you get wrong, and you count how many you should have caught and you didn't. We can do better than that. What Mike's model, which is based on work in the Oxford Computer Science Department, um, does is we predict the probability distribution that something might be in a particular class. So we've applied this to galaxies in. So for each galaxy, um, we've trained a model using galaxy zoo data, uh, and then we predict a probability distribution that this galaxy has a particular property. In this case, I think it's spiralness. Uh, and red is the real votes from volunteers. You see that most of the time we do okay. What we then do is use a technique called dropout to, to have 20 different models, each slightly different but all trained on the same data, uh, predict the same thing. So then you have a population of data. What we find when we do that is that we can produce a model that can correctly predict not only the probability distribution, but that it, it, it's suitably confident uh, about what it's doing. So um, you can predict here, this, if you have a maximum allowed error, so how, conf how close to the human score you have to be to count the classification as a, as a hit. Um, what we should have is this blue line, and what we have instead is this yellow line. So this gap is the overconfidence of the neural network. And when you run a whole population of them, you find it's pretty good. 
Now, sorry, I, I've sort of run out of time to do this in detail, but the point is that we now have a machine that knows whether it when to be confident and when it doesn't. We can also then look at which galaxies the machine wants to learn about. So you look at those galaxies where the machine is often confident, but where it disagrees with other instances of the machine. So if you have a crowd of machines, an ensemble of machines, if they're all confident that they disagree with each other, you know that galaxy is interesting. And then we show those galaxies to uh, volunteers. So for example, let's just go here. So for this particular problem with a galaxy zoo data set, these bottom galaxies are those where the machine is confident and tends to agree with itself. So these are very quickly the galaxy learns to do boring elliptical galaxies. Lovely elliptical galaxies, but easily classified elliptical galaxies. The most interesting galaxies to the machine are these at the top. You can see that they are sometimes interacting galaxies. These are galaxies with other stuff in the field. Uh, these are interestingly star forming or, or, or disruptive galaxies. And the model that we created here, we didn't tell it anything about the properties of these images. We didn't tell it that these were easier than that. It's discovered that for itself. And on Galaxy Zoo now, if you go to the enhanced workflow, it will give you the hundred or so galaxies that the machine, as of yesterday, most needs your help to classify. And this has hugely sped up the classification process so that we can go through very, very large data sets. So in summary, citizen science is a brilliant way of dealing with very large data sets because it allows you to operate from a position of joyful ignorance, right? I don't have to make an assumption about what is in my data set or what is interesting. But with the help of the kind of machine techniques that Mike's put together, uh, along with the rest of our team, we can now scale to very, very large data sets. And my hope is that this keeps open a window in the LSST era and beyond for the kind of science that the Vorwerk represents, where you can find the unusual things and worry about them. It is, I think, modern. It depends on the web. It depends on machine learning. But it's also very old. And I want to finish with this guy. This is Arglander, uh, the Prussian astronomer who invented the science of variable stars. Uh, and he did so partly by asking people to send him their observations of variable stars so that he could catalogue and understand them. Um, he said, I've got, uh, there's a quote from him, which says uh, that he had, in, in appealing for observations, he said, I have one request, which is this, that observations must be made known each year because observations buried in a desk are no observations, which is nice. Should they be entrusted to me for reduction or even publication, I will undertake the task with joy and thanks and will answer all questions with care and with the greatest of pleasure. I think that's what we're doing with Citizen Science, and I'm happy to answer your questions now. Thank you very much. I understand that was an awful lot of information delivered very quickly, but there were penguins in the middle. So. <laughs> Questions for Chris. Right. I've got two. Ask one's kind of specific, one's more general. Cool. So the specific one is in the situations where, given the, your example of like the essays or the example of um, gaps in classification, when it gets the outliers wrong, does it just kind of group them in with the average in some way that it's hard to distinguish otherwise, or is it? Can you tell that it somehow got it so, so, so you mean in the machine learning case? Yes. Where, yeah. So, so there's two, two things that happen. So the first thing that happens, if, you, if, if for example, you, you've trained on a, a large training set, you train a modern CNN on a large training set, but then you start finding things that aren't represented in that training set, uh, a common case is that it, it just decides that those are part of one or other of the categories, and they'll be randomly assigned. If you're smart, or in my case, if my student is smart, they'll realize this might happen. You go to great lengths to have a representative training set, including maybe you deliberately overpopulate the rarer examples. And then you retrain. But when you do that, what you're essentially doing is you're forcing the network to use its limited budget for training on those outliers. So what happens is you get worse at doing the bulk of the population. So you have to trade off one way or the other. So my 
Assumption, what's happening in the supernova case is we're relieving the network of the burden of caring at all about those outliers. We don't even have to identify them in advance because the volunteers will do that for us. Um, and then you can use your training budget where it's most needed on the bulk of the, on the, bulk of the data. So that's the trade-off that's happening. Um, you can also get overtraining where the network essentially learns each specific example you give it. And then when you give it the next new galaxy, it's guessing randomly. But that, that can be avoided. But mostly it's about this. It's about where you spend your training budget. Does that answer the question? Yeah. The, the second question, well, I'll the next one, um, is given your experience, what makes a good citizen science project kind of generally? What are the things that you should try? Well, having penguins in it helps. But actually, so, so the biggest surprise for me is that the uh, beauty of the image or the perceived beauty of the images doesn't matter at all. So we were worried that Sloan was full of blobby galaxies and people would, we thought, expect the New York Times galaxies, you know, the big Hubble pictures. People don't care. That feels like real science to them. And what motivates people is that they want to contribute. So the thing that really matters is how clearly you can communicate why you want people to look at this data. So if you help us with this, we can do this. The clearer that statement is, the better the project. Um, I, I have continually been wrong about which projects will be popular. I thought Planet Hunters would fail. Um, the one that really confuses me is the project called Gravity Spy, which is looking at LIGO data but it's classifying noise in LIGO data, and that's been used by the consortium. But they filter all possible real detections mm -hmm. out because they didn't want citizen scientists publishing, uh, which makes sense um, for, for their particular use case. So, but there was a community of about 25,000 people who spend a lot of time classifying LIGO noise because they know that that's going to help the project. So it's that. You need to have this clear scientific line. And then people can get distracted and find the unusual stuff and, and do all of that good stuff as well and, and play with the data. But you need to say, help us do this so we can do this. I have a quick anecdote and then a question. Um, so with, whenever I was in senior year of high school, was right whenever Galaxy Zoo came out, and my teacher bet that none of us could classify more galaxies than she could over a weekend. So I smugly doubled her count. And that was the first point that I think I felt like I contributed towards astronomy, which Thank you. it could have, yeah, could have yeah. pushed me towards the path. Uh, but question about LSST data, are there any things that you expect, unexpectedly, that Galaxy Zoo or the Zoo universe might contribute towards? Yeah. So. Um, we're beginning to think about specific projects for LSST. We're actually built into the LSST data management system. So you'll be able to, if you're, I hope a lot of what will happen is people will search for something from LSST, will expect 20 back, and because it's a great survey, we'll get 20,000 back. With one command, you can transfer that data to Zooniverse and, and begin to launch a project. And the things I'm excited about are low surface brightness features around galaxies. So doing a proper census of shells and, and the more interesting structured tidal features so that we can constrain merger histories. Um, in the solar system, I know people are excited about a survey of uh, active asteroids. So asteroids, there, there's this population of asteroids that suddenly sometimes show coma as if they're a comet because they've bashed into something and broken through to some old ice. So a proper survey for those, that looks like a good synthesis size nice project. In the transient world, I think it's a bit harder to understand, but um, I, I'm certainly interested in, I think, some of the repeating transients that you see. A lot, a lot of the brokers that have been built to sort through, that, the software brokers to sort through the LSST stream are looking for clean samples of type 1A supernovae uh, or, or other known things. And we know there's a host of flaring and interesting behaviors that, that are there and are interesting. Um, one set of stories I didn't tell, but which is in my book, which is out in January, uh, in this country, uh, is um, what tends to be known as Tabby Star, but which I call Bo which we should call Bojin Star, which is this uh, Kepler star that had these 20% dips randomly. There's now a category of stars that seem to display these random dips. Getting those out of the LSST data with very spotty uh, coverage. Uh, every three days, not every 30 minutes like Kepler. I think that's something that, that a citizen science project could address. So there are loads of good ideas, but we've tried not to say 
for LSST, our two projects will be this. So we need to see what the state of the field is and what the state of machine learning is in two, three, four years' time, whenever we get on sky. So have you seen um, the total population of involvement you know, of citizen scientists? Has that changed much over time? Um, so in number it has. So we add about 150,000 users a year. Okay. Um, so we're up to 1.8 million now, I think. Um, what really happens is that people come do a project for a few months, a few weeks, and then they go away, and then maybe they come back five years later because they heard about something or they're reminded that the project exists. And um, what I haven't had time to talk about is the demographics, and, and that's almost the most interesting thing. Turns out when I thought we were building the original project for amateur astronomers that I would go and talk to, we were completely wrong. Um, the audience for Zooniverse projects is not generally engaged with science before they start. So they are what my education colleagues call science attentive, which means that uh, they would, if they're reading the newspaper, they would read a science story if they came across it. Uh, but they won't buy Scientific American and they won't go and seek out a planetarium in a new city. So that's a really interesting audience because those people wouldn't come to an astronomy talk on an open day. Uh, they may, would, maybe wouldn't make a special trip here, but they might come in if they were going past. Um, and so to be able to reach that audience and, and turn that audience into people who suddenly care about the details of the spectrum of the galaxy they've just seen is, is really, really interesting. Um, they're also, they're pretty flat with age, so we get people of all ages. Um, the astronomy projects are dominated by men over women, unless you control for the amount of work done, in which case women do much more work on the projects than men, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, so yeah, and th those statistics have been pretty, apart from the growing crowd, have been pretty solid over time. We're beginning to see people from outside. It has been UK, US dominated. Um, we begin to see people from other parts of the world take part as well. We've made it easier to translate the projects, uh, and that seems to matter. Just kind of following up on that, has there been any kind of like sociological research into? Yeah, we've worked with uh, we've worked with everyone from um, sort of the social end of computer science uh, to look at behaviour online to psychologists, to information scientists, to uh, a bunch of economists who were completely confused by why anyone would, could donate their time for free. Because uh, it makes no sense if you're an economist uh, at a certain stripe. So yeah, so, so if you go to um, the publications page on Zooniverse, there's a meta category, uh, which has been interesting. I think um, some of the most interesting work has been around the effect of gamification. So it's very tempting to start giving people points or, or so on, and, and we found in some of our work that that's very effective, but it completely changes how people think about the project. So uh, they start talking about it as if it's stressful, as if it's work, uh, rather than exploration. Um, and the positive benefits of participation in, include, normally include a change in attitude towards science. People start to think of science as a more inclusive Thing that goes away the moment we turn it into a game. So that was really interesting. Um, we've also had, in the Snapshot Serengeti project I showed you, 70% of the images have no animals in, because the camera malfunctions or the grass waves in the breeze or whatever. Um, and we took out all of those images. It's easy to run a machine learning tool to get rid of the blank images. Uh, and people did much less work. And so it turns out that people blank, 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 zebra is much more interesting than zebra, 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 wildebeest, zebra. And so we're beginning to work with information scientists to figure out how we, like, how we deal with that. Like, do we put the blank images in, even though there are some even though blank we don't, images? Sorry? Just keep, like, 20% of the blank Right, but do we tell people, we should have to tell people we're doing that? And then, so, so this becomes, so we've got quite a few research into, like, ethics of online behavior and stuff like that. Which for an astronomer is quite a strange adventure. Uh, but yeah, we've worked with all sorts of people and it's been one of the, the great joys of this project has been discovering all the people we should have consulted at the beginning. Any last questions? Uh, uh, so is there a decay of the number of users as soon as the site goes up? Per, for, for a given project, yes. Yeah. So, so, so when a project launches and we send an email and advertise it, you get a spike. 
and then that decays, and then there's a steady state, and then the more the scientists interact with the project, the higher you can make that steady state. So um, making a small amount of time to be in the community or to write blogs or to, to talk in whatever way to the volunteers is the thing that makes the difference. Uh, but it also means that we go through a testing process for the new project to make sure that it's going to produce good data from the start because you're going to get, a lot, most of the data you get in the first year will come in the first week. And so you have to worry. And then there's the unexpected successes. There's a, there's a project called the Andromeda Project, uh, which is Cliff Johnson, who's now at Northwestern, and Julian Delcompton from, from Utah. Um, they were looking for clusters in uh, the FAT Hubble survey of the Andromeda Galaxy. So it's just identifying clusters of stars in crowded star fields. Perfectly good project, but it went through its million images in much less than a week with 20 people looking at each one. And I don't know why that project was such a hit. Julian and Cliff just tell me the images are beautiful, but I, I'm not convinced it's that. And in fact, the data says it's not that. Uh, so, so, so sometimes people just have these unexpected hits that, that, that just take off. Uh, and then those volunteers then go looking for other projects to do. So there's a sort of ecosystem. Okay, well, Chris has open talk slots through tomorrow afternoon. And if you are interested in going to dinner with us tonight, Stick around up front, but if we could all thank Chris again.